Well hey and welcome back to part 4 of taking a good lathe and completely rebuilding it. In the previous video we finished off the new cross slide, complete with the new oilers and oil channels. And we also got the new lead screw made and fitted. And so far I'm really happy with how the project's coming along, so if you haven't seen those videos I'll make sure to put a link to them. So for the next stage of the project, it's going to involve making a new compound and tool post. You'll probably remember that the lathe came with a very standard swivel type compound. And this was generally used for cutting tapers. And I think it's fair to say that this design, or at least this setup, wasn't very rigid at all. You're going to lose a bit of rigidity with the slide itself, but I think most of it was being lost at the mount. And by that I mean it was only being held in place with two M6 bolts, which really isn't a whole lot considering that I'm trying to push this lathe to do 2mm cuts in steel, and looking back on it, I'm surprised that the bolts did as good of a job as they did. Even still, it was causing me a lot of issues and it needed to be replaced. Now rebuilding or reworking the compound to fit on the new cross slide and work with the T-nuts is not out of the question, but I think for the moment I'm going to ditch it in favour of a new solid compound, and that's going to be very similar to what I had on the old lathe. Essentially what I'll be making is a solid riser block for the tool post, and generally they're going to work out to be a lot more rigid than any other setup. The only real downsides are that you can't cut tapers using a solid compound, but considering just how little I use the current compound, and considering I can always cut tapers using other methods, I stand to gain more from having a solid tool post than I lose. So first things first, let's talk about the material. Now like the rest of the build, I have some cold rolled steel which I picked up, and whilst it wasn't my first choice of material for making the cross slide with, it's probably going to be okay to use as the starting point for the tool post and the compound. I think cast iron would have been the way to go given that it does handle and dampen vibrations a bit better, but given that steel is going to be stiffer and stronger, plus it was the only material I could find in the correct size, I'm going to go with steel and in the end it'll be just fine. Now the long rectangular piece is going to be the block for the compound, and the cube is going to be used for making the tool post. What I'd like to do first though, before I start machining, is a bit of heat treatment. Now the steel blocks that I have here are made from the same cold rolled steel as the cross slide, and as the name implies, when they form the steel in the foundry to make it this shape, it simply rolls through rollers when the steel is cold, or at least below its internal recrystallization temperature. This is opposed to hot rolled steel when the metal is red hot and it's easier to form. Now there's many reasons why you do this. You know, one reason is you end up with a more dimensionally accurate piece of steel, because when you form steel when it's hot, you have to worry about it shrinking as it cools and warping. Pieces that are rolled when they're cool tend to be a lot more dimensionally accurate and square. Another reason why you do this is by cold rolling it, the metal gets stronger easily 10-20% to 20 stronger. Now the reason for this is simply down to the fact that when you squash or deform steel at a low temperature, the internal microstructure also bends and deforms, and any subsequent movement is going to be made a lot more difficult. If you've ever bent a piece of steel, you'll know that the area that gets bent becomes a lot harder to bend again after it's bent the first time. Another example is if you ever used a ring roller, you'll know just how difficult the steel becomes to bend as you keep on going. Effectively, the more you work it, the more the steel work hardens. The problem that we now have is that we now have these pieces of steel that are being squashed, and like a spring, there is a fair amount of tension that is built up in the internal microstructure of the steel. The problem I'm going to face is that once I start to machine it, and machine it unevenly, say taking more off one side than the other, the stress that's built up in the part is going to start to let go, and the part is going to start to warp. We saw this a few weeks ago when I made the cross slide. I took a whole chunk off one side, and then when I flipped it, the part had a huge dip in the center because the middle had sprung up. And this is simply because there was a lot more stress in one side than the other. I simply machined away the other side that was keeping it, I guess, in equilibrium, and as a result, it sprung up on one side. As a better visual example of just how bad it can be, a while back I took a piece of 12mm steel plate, and I milled about 10mm off one side. Now after taking it out of the vise, the piece of steel which was perfectly flat beforehand, I could now get a 0.1mm shim underneath it. Now obviously that is a bit of an extreme example, but it does go to show that the internal stress of a metal can easily warp the part, and if you weren't aware that this was going to be a problem, or you didn't measure it, you probably wouldn't notice. And with the parts that I'm trying to make this time round, you know, they need to be quite accurate, so even less than half of that, 
so 0.05 of a millimeter, would easily take these parts out of spec. The point of all of this is I don't want to risk the steel part warping, so I'm going to go ahead and anneal it. Now fortunately this project got delayed by about 4 days because the state has gone through a pretty rough heatwave and it was unwise to use the furnace at this time. Being completely honest, I'm not in the most bushfire prone part of the state, but the workshop was only about 5km away from a pretty rough bushfire about 5 years ago, so I definitely don't want to risk it. But thankfully once the heat wave came down, I was able to get going. Now the process for doing this is really quite simple. We'll get the steel in the furnace and get it going until it's red hot. Now I did have a bit of trouble getting the furnace started. As you can probably see, I wasn't getting a good mixture of air and propane. Which was a bit strange because I hadn't changed anything since the last time that I'd used it. And trying to increase the flow of propane or trying to open up the air vent to get more air in wasn't seeming to do all that much. Now as it turns out, what was causing the issue was that a spider had been living inside of the propane torch. And he was obviously disturbing the flow of gas. So once I'd found him a new home, the torch seemed to work just as good as it always had. And if you're wondering why I didn't do this the first time round with the cross slide, it's simply down to the fact that the piece of steel didn't fit in the furnace. Now it took about 30 minutes for the pieces of steel to heat up, and once they were both red hot, I let them go for another 30 minutes. This is just to make sure that they'd heated all the way through. And effectively all we're doing now is resetting the internal microstructure and getting rid of all that internal built up stress. And once that was done I simply turned off the furnace and let it slowly cool overnight. And this is typically what we'd call annealing a piece of steel. The next day the parts were cooled and they were good to go. They have picked up a little bit of scale but that's nothing to worry about. So the first thing I'll do is I'll get it in the mill and cleaned up. Now I had someone ask why the fly cutter was cutting on both sides and the first reason why is it was a little bit out of tram and ever since re-tramming it, it still cuts a little bit on both sides and my best guess is that the tool holder is deflecting a little bit on the first pass I think these new inserts aren't as sharp as the old ones used to be and it's simply flexing on the first cut and then it's cutting on the back. With most of the faces now done, I'm now going to make a change to the design. Initially I was planning on having a bit of overhang to get the tool post a bit closer to the spindle, but looking at it in person, as opposed to looking at it on a CAD drawing, I think it was going to be a lot more overhang than I initially thought it was going to be, and it probably wasn't worth doing. So rather than turning it into chips, I'll simply cut it off and use it in a future project. With the block now cleaned up, I'm now going to make a change to this design compared to the old riser block which I used on the old lathe. The old design was simply a steel block which rested on the cross slide and it was held in place by only two cap head screws. The new design is going to have a slot that will register in the T-slots and this should aid the bolts in preventing the tool post from shifting under load. What we're also doing is keying it to the T-slot and this should make sure that the compound remains square to the cross slide and this will be important later on. Now I do want to give credit to NBR Works who also did this but one change that I am making is that I'll be only doing this on one slot whereas he did it on both. 
I'm not sure if it'll make a huge difference, but I do think constraining it using only one slot is probably the easier way to do this. Either way, I'm sure this will make a huge difference compared to the old design. So what I will do is I'll rough away most of it first, and then I'll come in later and then take it to final size. Now the first fit was just a little bit oversized, which is probably a good thing because I can then take it out, file it down bit by bit until the fit is pretty much perfect. And that is about as good of a fit as I could have asked for. With that now done, I can now take it to the mill and get it taken to its final height, which, at least on paper, should match the height of the old compound. With that now done, I'll take it to the milling machine and then machine in a chamfer at one end. Now this is partially aesthetic because having a simple block was a little bit ugly, but it's also a bit for safety because I just know I'm going to scrape my arm on that sharp corner one day, so I might as well machine it down, make the thing look a little bit nicer and be a little bit more safe. And at least to me, I think that looks a lot better. Now what I'm going to do next is make another design change on the fly, but unfortunately, it is going to cause me a few issues in a little bit. Now the original plan was to use two bolts to hold the compound down and have a T-slot run up the right hand side. And the reason for this was to simply mount the mist coolant or any other indicators and mount it using some sort of T-nut. However, at the last minute, I made a quick design change to make the T-slot run lengthways. Now I can still use this for holding indicators, but I can also use it for holding the tool post in place. For example, if I need to shift the tool post to the left, I can easily do that. And you'll probably be surprised just how often I've had to do this in the past. This will also be in addition to using a fixed tool post stud, but all of this is about giving me options just in case I need a really strange setup and I'm able to do it. Now all of this means is that the two bolt holding pattern became four. And if I was thinking a little bit more at the time, I probably would have changed it to three and you'll see a little bit why later. So the first thing I'll do is I'll drill the holes and then get them counterboard. 
I'll then get an M12 hole drilled and tapped, and this will be for the tool post stud. And finally, I'll get the T-slot cut. Now this time round, I'm going to be using a proper two-flute slotting cutter, as someone suggested that I should be using. Now admittedly, I don't like using these two-flute cutters in steel, because I find them to be a little bit more rough than the four-flute option. I mean, visually the cut does look fine, but through the hand wheel, it does feel a lot rougher. The important thing though is that there's a lot more room behind the flutes, the chips are getting ejected a lot better and the slot isn't getting clogged. Now because I added two extra holes, I also needed two extra T-nuts. And I think that's looking pretty good so far. And that pretty much wraps up the solid compound. All in all, I'm really happy with how it's turned out, and I'm really happy with how the project is progressing so far. I do apologise if there's been a little bit less machining than normal this week, but unfortunately with the few days that I lost during the heatwave, the project is a little bit behind schedule. And unfortunately this project, which I initially thought was only going to take about three weeks to do, has simply spiralled out a little bit. But my plan is to get this finished sometime in the next week and hopefully move on to the next project. So for everyone who's made it so far, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you next week.